Okay. Good morning. Shall we start? Um, good morning. Please, please take your seats as quick as possible. Um, so today we're going to start with uh, a brief introduction to um, additive manufacturing processes. Okay, we're not going to go too much into detail about um, every single process. We'll do that over the next uh, lectures. Um, in each uh, of these processes, I would like to give you a brief uh, historical perspective, um, how they were uh, invented and then developed um, over the years. Some of the processes that we're going to be uh, discussing this, uh, this semester, because we don't have time to cover all the additive manufacturing processes, some of them are also not as relevant, but uh, we're going to focus on VAT photopolymerization or sterolithography, uh, laser sintering, uh, mainly using uh, plastic materials, but bearing in mind that we can also use metals, and this is extremely important for the, auto, uh, for the uh, aerospace industry. FDM, or extrusion-based uh, additive manufacturing, which you are probably most familiar with, and this is also the technology that you're going to be using during your lab sessions. And finally, some inkjet uh, technology uh, that some of you already have at home, although not for printing in three dimensions, but to print in 2D. Do you want to take a seat? Come in and take a seat, please. No? That's fine. Uh, in terms of these specific projects, we're going to look at some of the most common applications, okay? How they work, the differences between them, and obviously because of that, some of the uh, inherent uh, advantages and limitations uh, that they carry. Finally, uh, towards the end of the lecture, I'm going to briefly touch on a new area of application for additive manufacturing uh, that it's called biofabrication or 3D bioprinting that is more related with the fabrication of human tissues and organs. And it's a big market nowadays, and uh, it also offers a lot of opportunities for uh, most of you that are interested in the application of engineering and manufacturing, in this case, uh, to healthcare applications. And then uh, I'll briefly discuss some future trends and how uh, the field is rapidly evolving um, and, you know, uh, pushing the boundaries of something that um, was a bit uh, unimaginable a few years ago. Okay, but last lecture, I've left you with a question. Uh, if you were to produce this cup with um, CNC machining, what would be the challenges or the problems or issues that you'd face? Yes. That's fine, that's fine, because there's plenty to discuss about them. So, why not? Guys, I'd like to hear your colleague. If you're not interested, I mean, you don't have to stay here, okay? But if you are, I would appreciate that you would respect your colleagues, okay? Yeah. What would be the potential issue with that? So you would have to remove material, okay? So you'd have to create this cavity. Yeah. What would be a potential problem or limitation that you could face? Remember that you have a, a cutting tool, okay? Let's say, let's say the cup is inside the steel. Yeah. Okay, so you're right. This could be a potential problem. And it can be a potential problem because you are using a cutting tool, okay, that has a specific length. If, that's, if the depth of this cavity that you are machining or drilling is higher than the length of your uh, tool, then you can crush it. 
okay? So this can be a potential limitation, the depth of the cavity that you are creating uh, by subtracting material. Also, if this works, maybe not. Okay. This undercut or overhangers that you were just mentioning. So if you want to machine this here, you will need more than three axes, okay? So normally, yes. Yes, I mean, that's also another problem, okay? But that's more related with the changes that you can induce on the microstructure of the material, you know, stresses, residual, residual stresses that arise from the machining. But that's more related with the microstructure, okay? And with your process parameters, the speed at, at which you are removing material. Uh, but I, I'm just thinking about, you know, the, this architectural uh, um, parameters related with, uh, you know, more practical um, issues that you could find. And one of these issues is that if you want to create this undercut here, you will need more than three axes. So normally, CNC machining only moves in X, Y, and Z. You need at least three axes to do this, okay? And in some cases, you also need rotation, okay? So on top of having the tool head moving in X, Y, and Z, you potentially have to um, have as well some rotational in different planes, okay, to create more complex structures. Also, you need to think that your block of material is going to be fixed on the building platform. So you're going to be able to machine all of this, but underneath your cup, you can't do it. So you will need then to turn your parts around, stop the machine, and then machine this um, uh, part of your cup. And obviously that will increase your production time, the costs, and all of that is not beneficial for your uh, processing. And in this case here, you will need a tool, okay? A tool that has a very small radius, because otherwise, this definition that you have here will not be possible of being machined, okay? So on top of having to have a three-axis machine, potential problems with depth, and the need to uh, use multiple steps or multiple stages to fabricate the entire uh, part, you also need multiple tools, okay? So you need to change tools depending on the area that you are uh, manufacturing, okay? So all of this increases the production time, the costs, and it requires quite a lot of uh, labor from the operator. So in terms of additive manufacturing, you know, you remove all of those problems, okay? because you are building layer by layer. So you are not limited in terms of the geometries that you can create, but um, also you build the parts in a single step, so you don't have to go through multiple stages to fabricate the entire uh, part. And you are not limited in terms, for example, in this specific case of the depth of your, um, of your cup or this cavity in particular, okay? Uh, but we're going to look at some of those advantages a bit uh, later on. Uh, when you think about product development, and not, about, not just about cups, when you think about product development, do you think it's exactly the same? I mean, the process is exactly the same as it was like 10 or 20 years ago? It's not. And um, this has changed immensely over the last, uh, the last few years. Um, some of, the, some of the, the, the processes that you use nowadays to uh, develop products require um, the combination of multiple areas of research, okay? And also have multiple teams with different skills involved all at the same time to develop a product and to translate that product from the bench side to the market, okay? From the drawing board into the market. You know, and those, those teams normally comprise not just engineers like yourselves, but also designers, uh, marketing people, all working together to make sure that you are able to translate that product to the market in a cost-effective manner, okay? Uh, so some of the major drivers and the things that have changed 
over the years um, in terms of product development are related obviously with the cost. Okay? So you want to produce at the lowest cost possible, but also you want to do that with high quality. You want to reduce the time to market. So from conceptual design until you put the, the product in the market, that needs to be shortened. And also you want to do that um, in a very uh, fast way, okay, using rapid, uh, rapid product uh, development. So in the, in the recent years, and to try and address these challenges, companies have changed their approach from uh, what they used to call sequential engineering uh, to what is now called nowadays concurrent or simultaneous engineering. And the difference is, before you would have these sequential steps, okay, conceptual design, then you'd have uh, the, the manufacturing, the development, and this would be done by specialized teams, okay? Concurrent engineering, the idea underpinning this strategy is that nowadays, during the design stage, you already have involved not just the designers, but also the people that will actually manufacture the product. And this enables you, for example, to detect any problems related with the design that will impact on the manufacturing. And by doing so, you eliminate those problems very early in the stages of development, and that will uh, reduce the costs of developing the product, and also it will uh, decrease the production time or the time to market. Okay? It's not an easy process to implement, okay? because you've got a lot of different teams involved at multiple stages, so the coordination is um, slightly complicated, but there are uh, significant uh, advantages. Okay? One that is obvious is the reduction of the production cycle, okay? so the, the time to market is shortened, but also uh, the costs, but you can also improve the quality of your uh, final product. Okay? So, and because we're talking about manufacturing and about technologies, one of the technologies that actually uh, enable this is additive manufacturing. With additive manufacturing, uh, we can create products that can be personalized to the requirements of a specific client or a group of clients. Um, that can be customized um, according to those uh, specific needs, but also it can be done in a sustainable manner with low or at least lower energy consumption compared to conventional uh, manufacturing, but also um, at much lower costs. Okay? And it's within this context of rapid product development for a society re that requires personalization and customization at sustainable, um, in a sustainable manner that additive manufacturing is really becoming important. So, I was reading uh, an article a few years ago, and I've decided to put this uh, because I think it's quite relevant nowadays. How many of you have heard about Industry 4.0? No one? <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. So, I thought this was quite... Um, clearly it's not. So, Industry 4.0, or the fourth uh, industrial uh, revolution, um, it's, uh, it's something that is used nowadays. Um, and it basically represents the automation and digitalization of all uh, manufacturing processes. Okay? And it's basically considered the fourth industrial uh, revolution. But what does this have to do with additive manufacturing? So, like I, like I was saying, I was reading this article a few years ago, and this uh, McKenzie was estimating that 3D printing could, um, you know, represent in the future, a share market of um, you know, something around 230 billion to 550 billion um, dollars, US dollars, um, by 2025. These values have been uh, massively increased, and the market share for additive manufacturing and products is much bigger than this. But how is this actually possible? And there are two main factors that contribute to that. One is the creation of new and speci specialized jobs. And one example is this, uh, this company, this North American company called Shapeways. Um, there are an online uh, service provider 
uh, for personalized 3D printed uh, products. So any product that you want to manufacture, if you want something that is customized, um, you can send it to them. They will print it and send it back to you. So th this is a huge market. Uh, and this allows to create uh, a new um, range of jobs, okay, with uh, specific skills that had, uh, haven't been uh, necessary before. The other great advantage of additive manufacturing that is also contributing to this fourth industrial revolution is the fact that you can shorten your supply chains. So basically, you can remove your production from low-wage countries and you can produce your parts where you actually need them. Okay? So you don't have to rely on shipments of raw materials or uh, parts for your, for your product. Can you, can you tell me another, or are you aware of any other area of um, uh, market area or industry that has been, uh, you know, possible because of additive manufacturing or, you know, uh, enhanced because of additive manufacturing? An area of application? Yes? Sorry? Exactly. So the medical healthcare, and in particular the, the, the prosthetic devices, that need to be personalized to specific patients because we are all different, because we all have different needs in terms of the effects that are created, this is a huge market. And it's an advantage because of the ability to personalize. So that's a very good example. Anyone else? Yes? Aerospace. <laughs> Aerospace. Aerospace it is, but you know, it has been, it has been uh, augmented. Uh, because of additive manufacturing. What about a completely new area that didn't exist before? If I tell you uh, 3D printing of meat to replace the steaks or burgers that you buy in the supermarket, that is actually something quite real. And there are companies in the UK, you know, Birmingham, for example, that are nowadays using mammalian cells to print meat. And you'll probably say, well, why do we need that? Uh, we need that because the processes that we have nowadays to produce meat are not sustainable, have a huge impact in terms of the environment. Uh, and so there is a need to actually be able to, to do that, to create artificial meat. So that's also a huge market, okay? Okay, in terms of additive manufacturing, some definitions that are important for you. So, the traditional definition for additive manufacturing uh, is uh, given by this uh, standard, the ASDM F42, uh, and it's the process of joining materials to make objects from a 3D model data, usually, not usually, always layer by layer, as opposed to subtractive methods like CNC machining. But the great advantage of additive manufacturing is that it is a biomimetic process, okay? It follows very closely many of the processes that we find in nature, all days around us, okay? One is, for example, the layering of soil, as you see here in these images that are deposited layer by layer. But also, if you pay attention to trees, the growth of the trees is also a very um, similar process to what we have in additive manufacturing systems. Some trees, you're going to see that they tend to bend because of the winds, but then they will straighten up again. And that happens because the trees have the ability to deposit uh, layers of material that are more dense in specific regions and therefore force a tree to get straightened again. Okay? But there are much more examples of this. But this is the real advantage. Additive manufacturing processes derive from processes that we find almost every single day around us in nature. And generally, independently of the technologies or the systems that we're going to be discussing, there are steps that are common to all of them. You always start by the creation of the 3D CAD model. If you are talking about product development, if you are talking about the development of a completely new product that didn't exist before, you'll need to design it, okay? But, and you will see in the next lecture, there are strategies. If I have this 
stone and I want to design something based on this existing design, but if I don't have a card file to support, how do you do that? Okay? We can use, for example, scanning technologies or imaging technologies, okay? and we'll have some demonstrations of those technologies on Monday next week. So you can, use, you can either design it directly in CAD or using uh, reverse engineering and imaging technology to create your 3D uh, object. This is then tessellated. The tessellation is not um, uh, something very complex. It's basically creating these triangles on the surface of your object. Okay? There are some rules about uh, these triangles. You don't need to know that. But what this basically allows you is to know exactly in 3D where your part is okay? and where each layer of your part is. And this is important for then the 3D printer uh, be able to reproduce exactly what you've designed. Then this is sliced automatically okay, by the software. You don't do this manually. And it's sliced in a, a number of layers. And then those layers are transferred to your um, 3D printer machine okay, that will reproduce exactly these layers using the materials that you've selected and using this, the technology that you have selected. Okay? So you need to know these steps and you need to know that they are common to all of the technologies independently uh, of the materials that they use or the working principle. Just to give you an example uh, of that, if this works. Okay. So what, what you see here, what you're going to see here, is the manufacturing of a turbine blade. Uh, and this is something that is done um, you know, almost every day in the aerospace industry. So you design the turbine. After tessellation, you slice it into a number of different slices. And this is done automatically by the software of the machine. And then in this case, this is physically reproduced or printed using a technology that we call <coughs> powder bed fusion. It uses metals, okay, different types of metals and alloys. Um, it has a building platform, and the material in the, in the form of the powder is uh, dispensed in the platform, and then you use a very high power laser to melt those, pow those powder particles together and join them together to form uh, three-dimensional construct layer by layer. So you melt them in the same uh, layer, but you also, uh, by doing so, you also merge them with the previous layer. So you obtain uh, a fully dense uh, construct. We'll talk a bit more about uh, the different um, advantages of this uh, powder bed fusion process um, over the next lectures. But... Uh, an important thing that you need to, to know is that many of these additive manufacturing processes, once the 3D printing of the part is completed, uh, you always, or very often, you need a post-processing stage, okay? Either to remove support structures for overhanging um, components or to remove the, 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 the material that has not been uh, processed. Okay, <clears throat> like I said, there are different processes. We're not going to cover all of them. We're just going to cover material extrusion, binder jetting, VAT photopolymerization, and powder bed fusion. Okay? The others are important, but we don't have the time to um, cover all of them. You don't need to know these definitions word by word. What you will need to know is for a specific technique, like for example FDM, you need to be able to classify it according to these standards. Okay? So, Material extrusion, normally what you have is the material in a solid state. Okay? Normally this is applied for uh, polymers. You melt it and then you extrude it into a, a building platform layer by layer. In the case of binder jetting, you have the material in the form of a powder in the building platform and then you glue those particles together. Okay? And that's how you build a three-dimensional object. That photopolymerization which is a very important uh, manufacturing system, uh, doesn't use powders and doesn't use materials in the solid state. It uses photopolymer liquid resins. 
So it transforms a liquid into a solid material, layer by layer, by promoting a chemical reaction that we call uh, photocuring. Okay? We'll talk about that a bit more in detail. Finally, powder bed fusion. There are two main processes that we're going to discuss. Laser sintering, normally used for polymers, and laser melting. They are similar but different. Similar because they, use, they both use a laser, a high-power laser. They both use a material in the form of a powder. The difference between sintering in, and melting. Anyone knows? So the difference between sintering and melting, and the, as a consequence, the difference between these two processes is that melting, you join the particles together and you uh, create a 3D part by melting the material. Sintering, you just eat up the material just below the melting point. So you're not melting the material. You are aggregating, joining the particles, okay, forcing these particles together to form a three-dimensional object by raising the temperature of the material just below the melting temperature, similar to the annealing process. Okay? All right. <clears throat> material extrusion. How does it work? So normally, a system, and you will see this during the labs, it's composed of um, a, plastic, a plastic filament a spool. Okay? So in here, the material is in a solid state. Then you have a building platform. And this building platform normally uh, moves only in the zeta direction, vertically, okay? to allow the deposition of multiple layers. You also have a print head. This print head normally is heated to allow for the melting of your uh, thermoplastic material, of your plastic. And you also have these two rollers okay, to pull the material uh, towards the inside of your uh, print head. Okay? So the material is in a solid state. It's pulled into your print head where it's heated okay, above its melting temperature. It goes... It undergoes a phase transformation and then is pushed through the nozzle as, and is deposited in the building platform as a filament. Okay? And is by adding these layers, okay, one on top of the other, they, they create a three dimensional object. This building platform only moves in the zeta direction, but this print head can move uh, in x and y. Okay? There might be some systems where you have the X and Y displacements in the platform and the print head only moves uh, vertically, but the most common is to have uh, vertical movements in the platform and then the X and Y is normally provided by the, by the uh, print head. Some of the advantages, very easy to operate. Okay? Uh, it's also quite cheap, uh, considering the materials that we use and also the technology that it's uh, involved. You can use a wide range of different thermoplastic materials, um, but it has limitations, okay? One can be the high processing temperatures that will depend mainly on the material and the melting temperature of the material that you use. Uh, the other one is that you always need to have the material in the form uh, of a filament. If you don't, you need to transform your uh, material that's normally supplied in the form of pellets. You need to use an extruder to melt the pellets and create filaments. And that takes time, adds costs. And very often, if you have overhangs, okay, as the one we've seen in the cup, you need to create support structures. Okay? Otherwise, they will uh, just crush. Okay? Support structures add time to the production, but also it adds costs. Okay? So these are some of the limitations of this process. We'll discuss it in detail next, uh, next lecture. Probably one of the most important ones, certainly the first to be developed, was VAT photopolymerization, or um, probably more commonly known as stereolithography. It was developed by Charles Hull uh, in the United States, and it was developed almost by accident. He was playing with some um, UV lasers, and he was irradiating these lasers, or these UV lights, over some photopolymers. And he realized that by radiating at a specific wavelength over a specific length of time, he could transform that liquid material into a solid. 
So if you can do that, how can you take advantage of that uh, process to create very well-defined shapes? So the way of doing that is instead of just using, for example, a lamp to irradiate the entire polymer, you can use a laser that is very well focused, and then you only cross-link or transform the liquid material into a solid in very specific regions, giving you the ability to shape constructs layer by layer. Okay? In this case, or in traditional stereolithography systems, you have a building platform. In this case, it's different from FDM. Okay? It's a vat where you have already your uh, liquid resin, and we'll talk about the composition of the liquid resin in uh, future lectures. But here you already have your liquid resin, you have your building platform, and in this case it moves down, okay? It sinks and it deepens inside the liquid resin. And then you have a laser system that irradiates normally UV light, but it can also, uh, you can also use infrared or a combination of UV and infrared. And then you have these sets of mirrors and lenses that focus the laser and allow you to direct the laser into uh, the building platform and as a consequence to shape your um, 3D parts. Some of the advantages of this technology, uh, <clears throat> when compared for example to FDM and other systems that we'll talk about, is the very high dimensional accuracy. Okay? The laser spots, uh, allow, because it's quite small, it allows you to create very fine details. Uh, which is something that is very difficult in FDM. <clears throat> and as a consequence, you can create very complex geometries. But it has its advantages. One of the disadvantages is uh, the need for these photosensitive materials. Okay? You cannot use any type of material. It needs to be a material that will undergo a chemical reaction when irradiated with light at a specific wavelength. And there are not a lot of materials with that capability. After processing, you'll need a post-curing process to remove support structures, to clean the material that has not reacted. And the use of a laser, it's um, a disadvantage because of its cost. Okay? It's really, really uh, high cost. And therefore, the price of a machine like this can be at least 10 or 12 times more than an equivalent extrusion-based system. By the jetting. Any, any questions? If you do have questions, please do feel free to interrupt me, okay? If there is anything that is not clear re regarding these, uh, these processes, okay? Again, I'm just uh, going a bit fast here because we're going to go and talk about each one of them uh, more in detail in the next lectures. <clears throat> okay, binder jetting or inkjet printing. This is basically the same technology that you have at home or that we used to have at home, okay, before this digital uh, era. Any traditional inkjet printing can be transformed into a three-dimensional inkjet printer. The setup is all, almost the same, um, a part of this uh, building platform. So normally in inkjet printing you have a building chamber with the building platform that moves only vertically, okay? And it moves in a stepwise process. The length by which this building platform moves in every single step is normally defined by the thickness of your slices, okay? The ones that you obtain from the SLI model. Also, in here, you will dispense your material in the form of a powder, okay? That comes from this uh, reservoir. And then you use your printing head to dispense a glue, okay? And this glue will bind your particles together and create a green component, okay? This component will then have to be post-processed, okay? Infiltrated with more glue to become more uh, robust. But this is the general process of inkjet printing. The advantage is that <clears throat> you can process materials or, or you can obtain constructs very quickly because you can have multiple print heads, okay? You, you, you don't have just one. You can have, have for example, uh, hundreds of them. And in that, by, that, by doing that, you can deposit uh, material in a much faster way in reducing the, the production time. Microporosity can be an advantage only, okay, when we're talking about healthcare applications, okay? 
it's not uh, porosity in general for manufacturing, for us, it's detrimental because it impacts negatively the mechanical properties of uh, your parts. Uh, the other advantage is that it ticks the box of sustainability. Depending on the material, so if you use a plaster, for example, you can use water as a binder. Okay? And this gives you um, a lot of, um, you know, in terms of sustainability, is much better than most of the glues that we use, okay, that we are not able to recycle. Normally, the materials, because of the materials that we use, the mechanical properties are not as good as, for example, in FDM or in uh, SLA. Uh, depending on the geometries of your parts, you can end up with trap materials. So imagine that you are manufacturing uh, a sphere. The loose powder that you have in here that, has, that is not glued together will remain entrapped inside the sphere. So then you'll have to remove it. Uh, the other disadvantage is the post-processing, okay? After you remove the parts, you will need to get rid of material that has not been processed. You need to infiltrate your 3D parts with more glue so that it becomes mechanically more resistant. Often, the surface finish is also not ideal, okay? So it needs post-processing also to improve the uh, surface finishing of your parts. Finally, powder bed fusion or uh, laser sintering same approach, but in this case, we can use either high-resistance uh, polymers or plastics, or we can use metals. You'll normally have um, a chamber where you have, um, sorry, in this case, you have a chamber or a material uh, reservoir. This material in the form of powder is dispensed on the building chamber where you have your building platform, and then you use a laser very high power laser, in this case is a CO2 laser, okay? Uh, especially if we're talking about um, SLS for polymers. The, what this will do, if, we, if it's laser sintering, it will sinter the parts and force them to join together. Or if we're talking about melting, then it will melt the particles, so it will increase that temperature above their melting temperature and join them uh, together. The advantages in general are the high mechanical uh, resistance that you can get in your parts because of the materials, okay, metals and high strength uh, polymers. Uh, the diversity of materials, you know, wide range of uh, plastics and metals, and metals are, for example, not possible of being processed in the other systems that we've talked about. Uh, and in the case of polymers, you don't need support structures, okay, because the loose powder can support your uh, hanging uh, constructs. In terms of disadvantages, uh, it's one, it's the cost, okay? The cost of the lasers is uh, tremendous, so this uh, will increase the initial investment they need to make. Because you are melting or eating up materials and then cooling them down, you have volumetric shrinkage, okay? And if it's not properly compensated, you can have variations in terms of the geometry and the dimensions of your parts. Okay, in terms of um, additive manufacturing, there are several advantages, okay? Advantages that you need to know when compared essentially with subtractive processes. One is the low volume production, okay? So when we talk about printing small batches of parts, because we don't need to create any tools and we can create parts in a single step, then additive manufacturing is extremely advantageous, okay? The other advantage is the lower cost of production. Again, because the machines are in general less costly than uh, CNC machining because you don't have to create tools, because you can create parts in a single step. So all the costs of processing when compared to CNC machining are much lower. You have a responsive production. What this means, basically, is that at any step of your process, if you need to change the design, you can just create a new CAD model, send it back to the printer, and uh, uh, fabricate. If you think about uh, CNC machining, that's not as straightforward. You need to create new tools, uh, new strategies to uh, remove the material, and that increases the production time and is not as responsive. 
And the same with injection molding, where you probably need to create new molds if you introduce changes in your parts. Uh, it also allows to shorten the supply chains, and we've discussed this uh, before. But the major advantage is the freedom of design. The complexity of the parts that you can create, the geometries, is uh, much, much higher when compared to uh, CNC machining. Um, but also you can do that at no additional cost. Okay? By increasing complexity, you don't increase the cost of your parts. Printing a very simple shape part is exactly the same as a very complex one, okay? as long as you use the same volume of material. You don't need to do any part consolidation, okay? so you don't need to, uh, for example, build a complex part uh, in multiple stages and then assemble them together. Here it's all done in a single uh, stage, even if you have movable components. Uh, and as we've said before multiple times, elimination of tooling. And this is really important. Okay? Uh, just a brief video to show you the application of these technologies in uh, very demanding industries, I like, for example, a new door is to be built. can you guys the hear on the back, clear. or is it too loud? It all looks yeah? perfect on the computer screen, but virtual reality cannot assure everything. Computers help, but real prototypes are required for real testing. It's fast and almost for free. By using rapid technologies, sample components can basically be produced overnight. Rapid prototyping, rapid prototyping serves the purpose of providing prototype parts to the relevant departments within a very short time frame, so that they can solve their problems very quickly. First of all, the machine's construction platform is filled with polyamide powder. Using CA data, the laser center method applies layers of layers of powder until the correct thickness is reached. The laser then creates the correct shape. You see, this, this is all powder that has not been processed, okay? So this is what, this is what I was mentioning by post-processing. Uh, Removing all the loose powder. applied when door hinges are made from metal. The process is called beam melting. So this, this is the laser, okay, Again, that is being irradiated. It is transferred to the machine, which then wells the requested form by laser. At the end of the process, Residual material is removed and the product is thoroughly cleaned. And now, just jump with us to another application department, the Formula One. During it's a bit old, okay, <laughs> but Formula One cars the, it's, still, it's still applied and probably even more than, you know, Pace back then. ...presents special challenges to the developers. And here is rapid prototyping one technique which enables new components to be produced within hours. Stereolithography is another laser-based procedure. This develops a 3D component from synthetic materials in a raisin bath. In the Formula One, it's important to come up with new ideas, achieve optimizations, create new components as fast as possible, particularly for the engine and for components in the wind tunnel. Changes are implemented very quickly here. And then you want to evaluate them in the wind tunnel, try out the real hardware. And this is what makes our components so important because it only takes one or two days until you get a finished component from a CA model. The next component can be tested immediately, enabling a very quick decision to be made. So this, this is to be ready what we were talking about when we said responsive production, okay? The ability to change designs produced without additional costs. Okay, but there are also challenges, okay? Uh, challenge that you need to be aware that you don't need to know um, by heart, but you need to be aware. Additive manufacturing doesn't solve all of the issues related with conventional manufacturing. There are issues in terms of the materials, okay? We need more materials, especially polymers, with um, higher mechanical properties so that we can apply them in very demanding uh, environments. But also when you think about the software, and you use this every single day, when you think about, for example, SOLIDWORKS, these softwares, and not just SOLIDWORKS, but any uh, computer air design uh, software, they have not been designed to uh, be applied on the creation of very complex geometries, okay? such as the ones that we can currently manufacture using um, 3D printing. Also, it doesn't allow for uh, topology optimization, though it's something that we can do with additive manufacturing. It doesn't allow for multiple materials. Okay? When you do CNC machining, you start from a block of a single material. With 3D printing, you can print multiple materials, creating functional gradients 
uh, in your parts. Okay? So there is a need for the development of softwares that can cope with these requirements or the ability that additive manufacturing has in creating parts that were completely impossible before uh, 3D printing. Also, affordability. And I'm not talking about the price of the machines. Okay? I'm talking about materials. If you buy a polymer for injection molding, the same polymer, but for additive manufacturing, can cost two or three times more, or even more than that, okay, in some cases. So there is a need for kind of uh, standardizing the costs of the raw materials that we use, okay, because there is no justification for this uh, discrepancy in terms of prices. Also, the other challenges, one is the speed, okay? If you manufacture the same parts with CNC machining, CNC machining is, in general, much faster. It's been around also for much longer. The size of the parts that we can print, when compared to uh, machining, is much smaller. So we're limited in terms of the size of the volume of the parts that we can print. Uh, also, depending, and this is uh, uh, probably more evident in uh, fuse deposition modeling, depending on the direction that you are depositing your material, you can have uh, an isotropy in your parts in terms of your mechanical properties. Okay? The materials can be more resistant when subjected to load in a specific direction uh, than in others. And the reliability. Okay? CNC machining and other conventional technologies that have been around for much longer than 3D printing, so the reliability of our systems um, is still a bit limited. In terms of the main applications, there are three, as we've mentioned uh, already, three fast-growing areas of application of 3D printing. One is the aerospace, okay, especially because of the metals. Uh, the other one, as your colleague has mentioned, uh, the medical industry, not just prosthetic devices, but also uh, printing of human tissues and organs, and the other one, obviously, the automotive industry. Okay? So these are some of the major drivers. And there are companies really adopting these technologies and creating plans for, for example, like in the case of Airbus, to develop uh, not just printing turbine blades or injection nozzles, but to create an entire plane using 3D printing. Okay? And the ambition that they have is that by 2050, this will be possible. Obviously, they're relying on uh, a sustainable uh, progress in terms of the technology that we currently have, but also in terms of the materials that we need to develop. Automotive is much more consolidated in terms of the application of technologies, mainly laser sintering, mainly polymers, either for interior components or for exterior, uh, external components, as you can see in here. So this is done routinely every single day in automotive uh, industries. Other less common products related with additive manufacturing, uh, you know, from lightning, uh, lightning or to furniture, uh, Shoes and dresses, I'm not so sure if they're comfortable, but uh, these ones are, you know, you can buy a 3D printed um, shoe, you know, football bird. It's, it's something that it's done nowadays. And you can customize it also for a specific athlete, okay, depending on his biomechanics. Um, as I've mentioned before, the printing of food, okay, we can now, using cells and materials, natural materials, we can create artificial food, okay? Food that is not going to just be used in terms of um, to compensate um, or to um, allow us to um, have much more sustainable process and to create less damage into the environment, but will allow us also, for example, to support space exploration, okay? This building is behind Another area, sorry. Another area is construction. I'm not going to play the entire video. Um, actually, we're going to try and move some. One of the one of the applications of 3D printing in construction. I'm not saying that it's going to be probably for high-end houses or buildings, but if you think of a disaster area. If you have the ability to very quickly create shelters or small houses for people that have lost their houses, 3D printing can do that because you can just uh, 
move your production line to those countries and print those houses. Okay? And this is currently being done uh, with different materials, not just concrete, but also with plastics. Okay? So have that also in mind. Medical prosthetic devices, uh, not just skeletal prosthetic devices, but also uh, dental implants or bionic ears. Uh, these are external devices that are being currently produced with 3D printing, a big market. And finally, the biofabrication. Okay? Biofabrication, very simply, is the ability to create artificial tissues or organs, combining your own stem cells with materials, okay, and print them layer by layer to mimic the complexity in terms of the structure and the function of your body, build that outside the body, and then implant it in the body. So, this is, I hope they, and I apologize for, for the image, but imagine that you have a bone fracture. We can create an artificial bone, because the bone is not able to regenerate on its own. We can create an artificial bone. This is biodegradable, which means that as this, uh, we just need two more minutes to finish, okay? Uh, this implant will degrade gradually, and as it degrades, your bone will regenerate. So by the time that this disappears, it will be completely replaced by new bones. So you don't need metallic fixations. You don't have to undergo three, two or three uh, surgical interventions. Okay? So this is a, a clear advantage of uh, bifurcation. Finally, and just, just to conclude, okay? Finally, all of these things that I've told you about, they're being developed on Earth. But with space exploration uh, increasing, how is it possible, for example, for an astronaut that uh, suffers an incident, breaks a bone, how can we have, for example, um, a bone substitute for that astronaut? I mean, we cannot send them back to Earth. Okay? So the European Space Agency, along with the UK uh, Space Agency, are developing a bioprinting system, and Manchester is involved in that, we are involved in that, a bioprinting system that we'll put in international space stations to try and investigate how can we create these artificial tissues and organs um, in space. And this will allow us in the future, in these uh, uh, space missions, long-term space missions, to do several things. Medical healthcare for astronauts, but also to create food.